Hello and welcome to episode 76 of the Study Legal English podcast. I am your host Louise and today we are looking at starting a claim in the civil courts. This episode is sponsored by italki, a platform of over 10,000 language teachers who provide one-to-one lessons to over 5 million learners. Now, Probably you're listening to my podcast because you're learning legal English. Of course, listening is a great way to improve your English. But if you really want to master the language, there's no better way to achieve fluency than with a real teacher. A real teacher can help you spot your mistakes, show you how to improve, and also help you to achieve your language goals. So go to go.italki.com forward slash study legal English and you'll receive $10 USD in italki credits for free when you purchase your first lesson. Of course, I'll leave a link and all the links that I mentioned today in the show notes. So why not give it a try? So as I mentioned, today we're focusing on starting proceedings in the civil court. Last week, we looked at the best practice before this happens, before starting a claim, including following the pre-action protocol. And I asked the question to you, what steps do parties need to take in your country before starting a civil claim? A few listeners sent in answers, and it was really interesting to see that In many countries around the world, there are quite similar procedures before starting a claim in the civil courts. For example, Aidan from Brazil said that although it's not a rule, it is good practice for parties for the claimant to send to the defendant an out-of-court notice, either by email or mail, and that would be the equivalent of the letter before claim or letter before action in the UK. And according to Ahmed in Turkey, there have been many developments in recent years in Turkey uh, promoting alternative dispute resolution. So, for example, mediation is compulsory for certain claims, trying to settle the dispute outside of court before making a claim. So now I have a new question for you. It is, how do you serve a claim on a defendant in your country? Is it difficult? Does the defendant try to evade service of a claim? Send me in your answers to louise at studylegalenglish.com or even better, leave a comment on the website page at studylegalenglish.com forward slash episode 76 so that Other listeners can also learn about the situation in your country. So before we get started, I also want to mention that this particular episode is also available as a video on YouTube. So head over to youtube.com forward slash study legal English to check out the video. So let's get started. Starting proceedings. If the parties simply cannot resolve a dispute outside of court, they've sent the letter before claim and maybe they've tried alternative dispute resolution techniques, but still they are unable, they have been unable to resolve the dispute, the claimant may wish to start proceedings. It's important to note, however, that civil proceedings must be commenced within the limitation period. This is a fixed time which begins when the cause of action arises, in other words, from the point when the claimant suffers the harm, and it ends after a number of years, depending on the type of case, the type of claim. So, for example, for personal injury claims, they must be brought within three years, Cases related to tort and contract must be brought within six years and certain land cases within 12 years. If a claim is brought after the limitation period has elapsed, the defendant can raise the defence that the claim is time barred. 
In this instance, it's most likely that the claim will be thrown out of court. And this means that it won't be heard. The judge will not hear the case because the claimant has waited too long for the claim to be brought. To ensure that the case will be heard, therefore, the claimant must bring the claim within the limitation period. Commencing litigation. How are proceedings commenced? Well, for most cases, the procedure stating how to start proceedings and where to start proceedings are set out in the civil procedure rules. You may remember that these are the rules which govern civil procedure in England and Wales. The first thing that a claimant must do is to fill out a claim form. This claim form is quite a straightforward document and if you're curious to know what it looks like, it can be accessed and downloaded from the UK government website. I'll include a link to it in the show notes. And accompanying this particular claim form, there is also a useful document which explains how to fill it in. Pay attention to the vocabulary here. I say claim form and we use the term claim form to refer to this document. In the past, other words have been used. For example, a writ for claims in the High Court and a summons for claims in the County Court. These archaic and somewhat complex terms were replaced with claim form when the civil procedure rules came into force in 1999. So the claim form includes sections which the claimant must fill in, including the claimant's and the defendant's names and addresses, the nature of the claim, the remedy sought, the value of the claim, and whether the case is concerned with any issues under the Human Rights Act 1998. The particulars of the claim must either be stated in the claim form or either filed at the court and served on the defendant separately. The particulars of the claim are details of the facts that the claimant relies on and further information about the damages that the claimant seeks. The claim form is verified by a statement of truth where the claimant confirms that everything written in the claim form is true. The claim form must be signed by the claimant, the claimant's solicitor or a litigation friend. A litigation friend is a person who makes decisions on behalf of the claimant, especially in relation to children or adults who lack mental capacity. If the claimant is a registered company or a corporation, it must be signed by either the director or another officer of the company. For some cases, for very simple money claims with a value of up to £100,000, a claim form can be filled in and filed online. However, for many cases, the claimant will have to download the form and fill it in and uh, make copies. Then the claimant should send these, the original, together with the copies to the court and pay a fee. But which court should the claimant send the claim to? Well, most claims are made in the county court, although certain cases such as those which have a value of over £25,000 or are particularly complex are made in the high court. I'll talk a little bit more about which court hears what type of cases in a following episode. So when the court receives the claim form, the court will then issue the claim, which officially starts proceedings. Here the court puts an official seal of the court on the original and the copies of the claim form. A seal is an official mark which normally looks like a type of inky stamp with the court's name and the date written on it. It's a way of authorising documents. The court also records the detail of the claim in its database and gives the claimant a reference number. After this, a number of documents must be served on the defendant 
in order to notify the defendant of the action being brought against him or her. So what is serving documents and how is it done? Well, according to the Civil Procedure Rules Glossary, to serve documents means to take the official steps required by the court to bring documents used in court proceedings to a person's attention. In other words, in this particular case, serving the claim on the defendant, it means making sure the defendant knows about the claim by sending him the correct documents. In civil proceedings, this normally should be done within four months of the court issuing the claim. So the court will either carry out the service on the defendant by sending the relevant documents by first class post or alternatively, the court will return sealed copies to the claimant for service. The documents to be served on the defendant are normally the sealed claim form, the particulars of the claim, which may be included inside the claim form or served separately, and a response pack, which contains an acknowledgement of service form, an admission form, and a defence form. Now, I've spoken to some lawyers about serving documents and they say serving documents can be rather difficult. Why? Well, because some defendants do everything in their power to evade the service of court proceedings. Therefore, nowadays, due to the complications which can arise, it is possible to serve a claim in a variety of ways. Of course, there are the traditional methods of fax and post, which we're all familiar with, but more modern ways are also acceptable. For example, via email, text message, voicemail, and even social media platforms. Although in some of these instances, permission from the court is required. Are you surprised about this? How are documents served in your country? Is it difficult to serve documents? Do you think it's appropriate to serve documents on social media platforms nowadays? So that brings me to the end of today's episode. Many of the words that I mentioned today are available in the Civil Procedure Rules Glossary. And uh, I mentioned that earlier on in the episode and I will include the link to that in the show notes. As always, members get access to further learning resources available at studylegalenglish.com forward slash episode 76. So I hope you found this episode useful and you've learned something new. If you enjoy the show, you can help me by subscribing either on YouTube, iTunes, liking the show, sharing it with your friends and leaving a review or comment. You can find other ways to support me at studylegalenglish.com forward slash support. So thanks for listening and see you next time. 